Come on, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. If you would, just please stand and rest on your feet. Give the Lord some praise. Come on, give the Lord some praise. I believe the psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof. Oh, magnify the Lord. You didn't hear me. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. If you would, please remain standing on your feet as we sing that great hymn of the church. Let all the people praise thee.
Amen. The song said, let all the people praise thee. That sounds like a great segue right into praise and worship. So if you would, you can remain standing. You can clap your hands. You can pat your feet. You can sit down if you want to. But let's get ready to welcome the St. Paul Young Adult Ensemble as we get ready for praise and worship.
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody grateful tonight? Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Is anybody really grateful tonight? Standing all over this building, why don't you act like you're grateful tonight? Aren't you excited about being in the house of the Lord? Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Come on, stand all over this building. It was the Lord that woke you up this morning. It was the Lord that put clothes on your back. It was the Lord that put food on your table. It was the Lord who allowed you to go to the jobs that you went to each and every day. Come on, you ought to put your hands together in here. Come on, come on. Let's thank the Lord. I'm grateful tonight. I'm grateful tonight. You ought to look at somebody and tell them I'm grateful. He's been better to us than we have been to ourselves. Our scripture tonight, as you get your Bibles, Ephesians 4, go down to verse number 11, Ephesians 4, when you get there say amen, Ephesians 4, verse number 11, and, 11, and it says, and he gave himself some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. The Lord's word for God's people. Amen. Okay. Let us pray. Oh, Holy Father, our God. You are an awesome, awesome God. Lord, we magnify, we glorify your name. God, we thank you now, even for this day, on a Thursday evening, God, that we can come even now and worship you. God, let us worship you like never before. Lord, we love you. Let our worship be for real, that you have no doubt that we honor and glorify your name. God, come and midst of everyone that's here, God. Bless us in a mighty, mighty way. Go from pew to pew, from heart to heart, God. Open our hearts up for what is about to happen, God. Open our hearts up that our ears may hear what you would have for us to hear, that our mouths will be able to repeat those things that you have said, said to us tonight, God, that we will be able to understand all that you have for us. Holy Spirit, come. Rest, rule, and abide in this time. God, we thank you. We pray that you would just bless every organization that is in operation, God. We thank you, Lord, even for this day to say to our pastor, we appreciate you. God, we thank you for him, God. We pray that you would continue to build him up, God, and make, have him to be that strong leader, that strong creature that you call him out to be. God, and we thank you for him. And we thank you for even the shepherd that is about to speak, God. We pray for Dr. Weary that he will give us a, a fresh word, God. And we thank you. We are ready. Our hearts are open. God, we thank you for this time and this night. We praise your name forever. Can everyone say amen with me? Can you say amen? amen. Do you love the Lord? Amen. 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 You may have your seats in the presence of the Lord.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, can we clap our hands and begin to celebrate the name of Jesus? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just want to say, excuse my attire. I'm out of uniform, but I just got off work. I had to make my money. Praise the Lord. So it was either miss out or come to church. I decided to come to church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Song says, I can go to God in prayer. Come on, let's clap our hands. And let's have a little church. Come on.
How many people know that you can call them when you need them? How many people know that you can call them when you need them? When you just sit back and think about all the stuff that you didn't been through in your life and you wonder how you got through it. You got through it because you understood that the prayers of the righteous availed much, and you knew that you could call on them when you need them. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, we thank God for the, for the ability just to call them when we need them. Sometimes you just can't help it when you think about his goodness and 
all that he's done for you. You can't help but to dance sometimes. Hallelujah. Y'all better stop. Y'all better stop. As you know, this is one of our pastor appreciation services that is taking place. Uh, and we are getting ready to worship the Lord through the giving of our gifts. Uh, but I have to call our vice chair uh, of the board here at St. Paul Baptist Church to come and make a few remarks just before we do so. Uh, and then I will come behind her with some instructions on how to do that. You know what, folks? By the fact that we're sitting here, we know we can go to God in prayer, right? And we know we have a whole lot to be grateful for. That young man sitting over there, Pastor Robert Charles Scott, we love you dearly. We are thankful. We're grateful for you. We really are. He is an awesome leader, teacher, preacher, administrator, a comedian, but also humble. <laughs> and I have to say this, the Omega Man, you represent them well. So guys, I would say for those of you that want to give something to Pastor in terms of appreciation, on your envelopes, you can designate that it's for Pastor's anniversary. On the Ungivelify, and whether you're a member or not, on Givelify, you'll see there's a category where you can give as well. Uh, and if you don't have an envelope, the ushers will give you one. But what I encourage you to do, if, even if you don't have money to give, let him know you appreciate him because a word means a lot. It means a lot, especially for these men of God who have a tough job to do every day, and they carry us with God leading the way. So I would ask you to make sure you specify on Givelify as well as on um, on your envelope, and Pastor will have a presentation for you on Sunday from the board. Thank you. Come on, you have heard uh, Madam Chairman's instructions. Uh, if you could please raise your gift with me, raise your gift, raise your gift. If you're giving with your envelope, um, please raise that high. If you're giving using your smart device, please raise that high. Whoa, raise your gift high. Okay, there we go. Now I see some gifts going up. If you would, pray with me while we consecrate these gifts. Uh, loving God, our Father, we thank you for the ability to give. We thank you for this momentous occasion. Uh, so right now we ask that you take this offering. We ask that you consecrate it, bless it, uh, so that it may be used for the good of your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you are on the inside of the aisles, there is a basket underneath your pew. Do me a favor, grab that basket and just pass it on down. If you are on either this side or this side of the aisle, there is a basket under your pew. Grab the basket and pass the basket down. gifts have been collected. If you would, please stand with me as you I sing all things come of thee. seated. It's preaching time. And y'all know we got a show enough preacher in the house. One that I do not really have to introduce to this congregation because everybody here knows him. Uh, but for those who may be here that do not, he is a native of Buffalo, New York. 
Uh, he is a double graduate of Virginia Union University undergrad and the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology where he earned his Master of Divinity uh, as well as Wesley Theological Seminary where he earned his, he earned his Doctor of Ministry degree. Amen. Somebody, some of y'all to catch that on the way home. Um, he is the very humble, the very gracious, the very kind, very loving pastor of a loving church over on Sugar Creek Road. The Mayfield Memorial Missionary Baptist Church where he has served as pastor for 13 years. Soon to be 13 years he has served as pastor uh, over at The Field, which is they have coined it now, The Field. The Field. For some of you that don't know, The Field is home for me. Um, so as you sit inside your tent doors, um, I ask that you open your hearts, open your minds to the word that is going to come from this man. Not only is he the pastor, but I'm going to go ahead and take the, the privilege and say this man is also my uncle, and I love him to pieces. Mayfield knows that if you mess with him, you mess with me. So if you would, do me the distinct favor by raising your right hand and extending it towards Dr. Weary and say, Dr. Weary, preach the word. Dr. Weary, preach the word. After this. No, 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 don't say that. <laughs> After the next election, the next speaking voice you will hear from this spot will be none other than the Reverend Dr. Peter M. Weary, Senior Pastor of the Mayfield Memorial Missionary Baptist Church, also known as The Field.
Let the church say amen again. Good evening, family. Good to be back at St. Paul one more time. We are here to celebrate something very important, and that is three years in ministry with uh, the Scott family. Amen. You do know, St. Paul, that you have one of the greatest, most skillful preachers in all of America standing right here. And I know that you will not allow him to be in demand everywhere because everybody wants to hear Robert Charles Scott. You will not allow that to happen and you not appreciate what you have standing right before you. It would be, as Toni Morrison says, just like walking past the color purple and refusing to notice. What a preacher, what a family, this wonderful family is. And I am just so grateful to you, St. Paul, for allowing me to be a part of that process. Uh, your, uh, your, your prayers and your gracious participation was one of the highlights of that year, three years ago, and one of the real privileges of my personal and professional life, because I'm convinced that God sends preachers. Amen. Amen. And I'm convinced that God sent this one to St. Paul. He, uh, one of the members right after the vote uh, stopped me on the sidewalk, and I won't embarrass him by saying who it was. It wasn't anything embarrassing, but I don't want to put anybody on the spot. He said, do you think we did the right thing? I said, well, what St. Paul needed was somebody who was at the top of the food chain, and that's what you got. Amen. So I'm just grateful to be able to call them friend. And uh, so thank you for allowing me to be here tonight in the Mayfield family, uh, your kinfolk to come by and to help you celebrate what God is doing. Um, I want to uh, thank God for you opening your arms to our son, uh, Marco McNeil and Brianna and Sanaya and Deuce, uh, thank you for opening your arms to them and for uh, creating a wonderful environment to do ministry uh, here at St. Paul. So thank you. Amen. Would you join me in uh, the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33? Ezekiel 33. I want to start reading at verse 30. I want to read it from the Good News Translation. Hear these words. The Lord said, Mortal man, your people are talking about you when they meet by the city walls or in the doorways of their houses. They say to one another, let's go and hear what word has come from the Lord now. So my people crowd in to hear what you have to say, but they don't do what you tell them to do. Loving words are on their lips, but they continue their greedy ways. To them, you are nothing more than an entertainer singing love songs or playing a harp. They listen to all your words and don't obey a single one of them. But when all your words come true, and they will come true, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. The word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. Pray with me for just a little while. I want to talk about what people hate about preaching. What people hate about preaching. Let us pray. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope. Let my will be lost in thine. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Preaching is the most important task in the world today. I had a physician tell me once, Pastor Scott, that as I was extolling the virtues of his skill and how grateful I was for his attention to me. He said, Pastor, don't compliment me. Your job, he told a young preacher, is the most important job in all the world. He explained that the President of the United States is only responsible as leader of the free world for every life on the planet. But the preacher in one single church is responsible for immortal, irreplaceable, irreplicable human souls. So it is that it's important. Its implications are more explosive than nuclear testing. Its ramifications are more far-reaching than genetic engineering. Its dynamics more complex than quantum physics. Its benefits are more expansive than modern astronomy. Preaching is the most important task in the world today. While preaching is the most important task in the world today, it is at the same time the most difficult task in the world today. It's difficult in its essence, and it's difficult in its evolution. It's difficult in its essence because preaching is not done at the behest of the preacher. It is carried out only under the instruction of the Almighty. Preaching, St. Paul, is a divine assignment. For this reason, it's the most difficult task in the world. For the preacher made of flesh and full of failure, situated in a context of flesh and failure, must systematically stretch his head above his or her context, open his or her mouth, and be inundated with transcendent truth. Preaching is difficult in its evolution because to preach in the modern context is to enter a world of skepticism and self-promotion, of humanistic knowledge and new age superstition. To make difficult matters even more difficult, the preacher is then ordered to proclaim his message to a world that is hungry but hostile, needy but neurotic, broken but bellicose, seeking but sold out, dead but determined to be deaf to the words of life. Preaching is the most important and difficult task in the world today. So we come tonight to celebrate preaching. We come to celebrate the preacher, the mouthpiece, this poor mortal frame whom God has ordained 
wear the heavy yoke of preaching good news in bad situations. Preaching is important, it's difficult, but preaching can also, according to Frank Thomas, be dangerous. For the preacher, that is, the, there are times when the preacher must stand and declare a message that is sure to ruffle the feathers of his hearers. In those times, the bearer of the message becomes the lightning rod of reaction because he's physically visible and available. There are times, St. Paul, when the good news of preaching has got to be administered with the medicine of challenge. And this is a sure prescription for trouble where the preacher is concerned. As long as the preacher's message is not offensive to anybody's ears, as long as he doesn't offend anybody in power, as long as he leaves alone the issues that will cause controversy, as long as I can shout a little at some point in the message, we sure had a good time. Uh, but if the message hits home, and if it probes too deeply into my private affairs, if the message sounds like it might hit that sore nerve of controversy that we've been trying to keep quiet around the church or in my house, then listeners have a system of sanctioning the preacher. Lord, I wonder who made him mad this week. Or we activate that Holy Ghost hush when the shoe gets a little too tight for our bad feet. Be encouraged. When the Lord is speaking and the shoe gets tight, remember it's always an orthopedic shoe. What hurts today will correct a painful problem for tomorrow. Y'all gonna stay with me? In this sense it becomes clear that there really is nothing new under the sun. Uh, lest somebody be misled into thinking that preaching today is all that different from the preaching of former ages, let me introduce you to a preacher named Reverend Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the son of Buzai, preached uh, about 2,600 years ago to the Jews who had been carried away captive by Babylonians. He had warned folk about their idolatry and had opened up for them the reasons they'd been carried away as prisoners. In his sermon, Ezekiel reminded the folk that they were accountable to God for the choices they make and forced them to look at their sin for what they really were, rebellion against God. In his preaching, Ezekiel had even taken on the leaders of God's people and called them, if you check the record, unfaithful shepherds because they failed to warn the folk of their sins and they allowed folk to be scattered and they scattered the folk by, the folk scattered by falling away from the worship of the one true God. That's why he cried, woe to the shepherd who scatters the sheep. All these controversial sermons had made Ezekiel an unpopular preacher. He'd become an object of ridicule and mockery among the people. Folk hate preaching like that. When our text for tonight opens, we see Ezekiel hunched over his desk and working on his sermon. And the Lord, as the Lord always does, stopped by to help the preacher bring it home. I'm only praying that the Lord will stop by St. Paul and help this preacher bring it home. What the Lord said to Ezekiel had to be upsetting because he was already a marked man. In fact, the Lord came by and reminded him in verse 30 that the folk, your folk, are talking about you all over town. He said, your name is on every street corner and they're talking about you in every house. The phone lines, Reverend Ezekiel, are burning up because of the stuff you've been saying and doing. The, the ones that are coming to hear you, the Lord said, are just coming because they don't want to miss nothing. Some of them are coming signifying, let's go hear what the word, what word has come from the Lord now. 
And so by their ridicule, by their invective, by their taunting and trolling, they made Ezekiel an object of scorn in the town just for carrying the word of the Lord. Can I tell y'all something? If, if the word of God is not hurting that shoe you got on, then sometimes, then it's probably not good news. Can I tell you something? That unless you receive some challenge from the word of God, that, that you're probably getting an opiate, some fast food, some junk food that ain't going to last. It's only going to make you fat and vulnerable. I can't say amen, say ouch. If the word of God is not at some time challenging you at the level of your living, then chances are it is in fact an opiate of the masses. So the folks said, let's go hear what the Lord has to say now because they wanted to miss nothing in case the preacher made that fatal mistake that we all been waiting on. I've come here tonight, St. Paul, to celebrate with you because you got a preacher. You got a preacher who cries loud and who spares not. It's always a big juggling routine, Pastor Scott, for the preacher to stand on special occasions like this because there's this fine balance, this razor's edge of propriety that you've got to preach good news and you've got to encourage the preacher and the preacher's family, but you also got to issue some challenge to God's folk. Can I just lift up for a few moments what it is that folk hate about preaching? Because there's some things, y'all, based on what preaching does and where preaching comes from and what preaching is that can make good folk hate preaching. What do folk hate about preaching? Well, well, they hate preaching because preaching confronts us with the truth of who we are. Look, 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 look at the irony of the situation. The same folk who talked about Reverend Ezekiel were still curious, no matter what the reason, to hear what he had to say. And maybe, maybe this is one of the things folk hate about preaching. Maybe they hate it that no matter why you come, even if you came to signify, if the preacher has done his or her job, the preached word is going to confront you with the truth of who you are. This is difficult, and but, but this is necessary because unless we're confronted with the truth of who we are, unless we first understand that we have some needs in the sanctuary, in the flow of the preaching, that we need something, that we have something we need God to do in our lives, unless we first realize that you can go to all the 12-step programs you want to, the first step is not done. And that is realizing that you have need of the preaching. The preaching confronts us with the truth of who we are. This is tough because a lot of us don't come to church to confront who we are as people, as believers. We come to church to feel good. Too many people in America are coming to church just to feel good. I got to go to church and get me something. I, I got to go and get my spirits picked up. I got to go and have my choir sing me happy. I got to go and help the preacher so he'll moan me crazy and hoop me silly. We come to get away from our burdens and problems. We, we come to get release from the cares and the vicissitudes of life. Just like the people in Reverend Ezekiel's flock, we We've got to understand that we can never really be free from life's burdens and cares, problems and vicissitudes until we confront the reality of who we are. A lot of our problems stem from who we've allowed ourselves to become in God. Ezekiel's flock had become, uh, the text says, a haven for gossipers and idolaters and abusers of one another. If you don't believe me, just check verses 25 through 28. They, they had some serious baggage, some serious generational problems, and they still were so frivolous about the word that they would dare come signifying. Listen, if you want a breakthrough the, 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 during this, this annual celebration, then make up your mind that you're going to be real with God. 
A breakthrough ain't never going to come. You will never get free. You will never really be blessed like you could be blessed. You will never find power. You will never find joy. You will never find deliverance. The shackles will never come off. The chains will never come off until you first realize that you got some. The interesting thing about verse 30 is that it's not the preacher who sees this problem. It's the Lord. God is the one who tells the preacher that this detestable behavior is going on. It's God who sees the great sin of the folk. It's, it's God who's been the invisible witness to every street corner gossip session. It's God who's tapped the phone lines of every Bell Atlantic church meeting. It's God who's been the silent secretary of every plot and ploy made in the name of the Lord but done under the power of the enemy. Folk hate preaching because it lays bare the truth of who we are. If you look in the mirror and your hair is nappy and your face is unwashed, your teeth are unbrushed, wrinkles are everywhere, it makes no sense to get mad at the mirror. The mirror is only reporting the truth about you who dared to look into the mirror while your face was so jacked up. Can I tell you, I come from the hood. It's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Yeah, listen, I come from the hood where when you comb nappy hair, sparks used to fly in the dark. Y'all ever seen that happen? Oh, y'all ain't going to pray with me tonight. I, I come from a place where when you comb nappy hair, uh, pain is the result. When, when you comb nappy hair, especially back there in that kitchen, when you would get back there, my sister would cry briny tears when mama got back there with that afro comb. You know, we didn't have all these fancy things we got now, stuff to make your hair relax and stuff to make your hair kink in a certain way. No, the hair we had was the hair we had. We made them afros up out of nothing, ex nihilo, like God did. We made them afros up out of nothing. We piled them up, waited till the hair uh, got big enough, got full enough, and then I would go to the barbershop to Willie, and I'd get a blowout. That's after the fact. That's after the nap. The blowout was artificial, y'all, because as soon as you let that rain get to that blowout, it was a blow up. Yeah, when you, when you comb nappy hair, we don't even have that cream they're selling now in the middle of the night TV. You put it on, and five minutes later, the bags leave out from under your eyes. None of that. No, what happens when the word of God is preached is all of the wrinkles show up. All of the stuff gravity has done, I, I, all of the stuff time has done is visible in the mirror of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you hear the good news preached, when you hear the word of God preached, it will show you the reality of who you are. Oh, can I get just a few people to be real tonight about who we are? Can I just help somebody understand and at least try to admit that you got some naps in your life? I ain't going to say amen to that. My hair is good. I got good hair. I got some Indian in my family. Here, here's the good news. The good news is if, if, you, if you just look in the mirror and let the gospel show you the truth about who you are, the good news is that the other side of that equation is that if God knows all them flaws, it's good to know that God lays bare who we are because it means that he not only knows our wrinkles and our naps but he also knows our needs. Can, can I just get somebody to shout that when the word goes out God is, rent, is, God is fixing up something that will dig deeply into your sanctified soul. God is ginning up something in the, in the other world. Ginning up something in the heavenlies that will bless you sitting right here in North Charlotte. That when the word is shown enough preached God will not only lay bare the stuff that's wrong with you but the word will also gin up the hope that is available to you. God will also reveal that the reason he showed you your naps is because he loves not just your hair, but he loves all of you. He loves you. He's crazy about you. He loves you so much that he orchestrates a sunrise every morning. 
just so the writer of Ecclesiastes could write, morning by morning, new mercies I see. God is crazy about you. He has engineered your golden moments so that even though you deserve to be wiped out, the good news, the gospel will show you that his mercy is everlasting. That his love is steadfast. That because while you were sitting there looking in the mirror, feeling bad about yourself, toe up from the flow up, God is steady speaking. If I did didn't love you, I wouldn't keep reaching for you. What, what, what people hate about preaching is that it shows us the truth about who we are. What, what, what people hate about preaching is that preaching secondly challenges us to act. I hear Katie Cannon talking about the work of Isaac Rufus Clark who, who taught always that unless a, a sermon had a behavioral objective, that is to say the preacher's got to know at the outset of the preaching what it is the word is supposed to accomplish in the hearer. Unless that's present in the preaching, you ain't doing nothing but rambling. I hear Miles Jones saying it also. Miles said that, that unless the sermon has thematic focus, that, that you really don't even have a sermon. Unless you got a thesis, you ain't got a sermon. I hear Samuel Proctor saying, unless you've got a proposition, you don't really have anything to build on. You've got to know at the outset what is the agenda for the preaching. And here, here it is, here it is. Preaching challenges us to act. And I found out after 40 years, y'all, that's what people hate about preaching. That, that's one of the big things people hate about preaching. They not only hate it because it shows us the truth about who we are, but people hate preaching because it challenges us to act in an environment that's not designed to do much acting. People know in an instant what to do when they look in the mirror of preaching, but, but, but folk hate preaching because nobody, because once they see what bad shape they're in, nobody can help but feel a challenge to do something. People hate preaching because preaching challenges us to act. The Lord told Ezekiel in verse 31a, he said, So my people crowd in to hear what you have to say. Watch this. But they don't do what you tell them to do. They, they hear, but they don't do. Mitch, I've been really contemplating, brother, preaching the same sermon every week. Like y'all can sing the same. Isn't it funny, Pastor, that the choir can sing the same song three times in the same month. And folk will leave church that last Sunday. Say, I wish y'all would sing that one again. That's my song. But you better not do it. You better not re recycle. Oh, y'all ain't going to help me tonight. You better not recycle too much. Don't folk will leave declaring you ain't... I've decided, Mayfield, here it is. I'm just going to preach the same sermon every Sunday, Rep. McNeil, until I see folk doing what the preaching said do. Are y'all ready? Yeah, yeah. They, they, the, the Lord says they hear, but they don't do. When you see your, your hair uncombed, your face unwashed, y'all can tell I don't like nappy hair. Can you tell? I don't like nappy hair that's out of control. You, when, when your teeth are unbrushed, wrinkles all over your face because you've been out in the sun too long, you, you know instinctively that it's time to comb, it's time to brush, and hopefully gargle, Lord have mercy. Time to wash. I don't know, may, may even be time to get something tucked and lift. I don't know. We avoid doing what we got to do, though. Because after you've been dirty and disheveled for so long, dirt and dishevelment becomes the way of the world. Come here, Plato. Here, here's the allegory. Once you've been in the dark so long, your eyes get acclimated to the darkness such that when you come out into the light, it hurts your eyes to look at it. 
fact of the matter is we don't do because we've gotten comfortable not doing. We've gotten comfortable not taking action. I mean, it's easier to just sit here and wait on God to change it than it is to get in the game and leave something in the paint. It's easier for us to just do nothing. Oh, it's not you. It's just human nature. It's easier for us to do nothing than it is to get in the game and make something happen, to change something after things have been raggedy so long after a while, raggedy starts looking right. Rep. Ezekiel got into trouble because he held a mirror up to their faces and let them get a good long look at who they were and, and they couldn't help but feel challenged to act but they knew that acting on the preaching was going to be tough. They knew that acting on the preaching was going to mean maybe some radical surgery on the wrinkled and sagging faith commitment of God's people. Folk hate preaching because it challenges us to act. Acting can be painful because combing a nappy head always is. Washing an unkempt face always is. Brushing neglected teeth always is. Facelift surgery always is. My prayer tonight is that nobody's going to leave here determined to be the same. But instead you'll leave challenged to take action when the preacher preaches. Be looking for what it is God is telling you God wants you to do. The church is already full of nappy-headed, wrinkled-faced folk with bad breath. That's why folk are running from the church. I know I'm right, even though nobody say amen. That's why folk are leaving the church in mainline religion because folk have figured out that the church is full of folk who look like them and they ain't doing nothing to change it. That's why evangelical religion is on the ropes because they've drunk some Kool-Aid from a man who ain't even figured out how to comb his his hair in the White House. So it is that when you hear the preaching, the main thing everybody sitting under preaching ought to do is be searching in the Holy Spirit, searching the, the, the annals and, 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 the, and the power of God, searching the preached word for what it is, God, that you want me to do. Oh, I'm trying to tell you, if you do these things, if you, if you just do these things, you will make your preacher's life more happy than I can even tell you. You will extend his life expectancy 20 years if y'all just start doing, start changing, start taking action on the word. Just, you, 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 but, but you know, that, that's, 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 that's what folk hate about preaching. They hate preaching that because it, it challenges us to take action. It, it shows us the reality of who we are. They hate preaching finally and maybe most importantly because preaching challenges us to change. Now, there's a difference between taking action and changing, right? You, you, you can take action on a thing and never really change. I mean, you can move, if you die, for example, and you, your body is at the funeral home and they move you to the church, you have transitioned, you have had some action, but you ain't changed. You're still dead. So, so it is that, that, that people hate preaching because it challenges us to change. People hate preaching because, because uh, pain of doing things in a different way is very great. It might be bearable if it didn't change the old familiar look too much. You ever seen church folk get mad over who sits on what pew? Oh, y'all don't have that at St. Paul. That just happened to come out in, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you ever seen folk get mad because somebody changed something the choir was wearing? I'll never forget, I'll never forget one of the first things I had to do, first fights I had to break up at the church when we got to Norfolk was I had to break up a fight between two choir members, a fist fight back in the choir room, not just fussing but fist fight. I, I had to step between the sisters and I, I was very concerned because I wondered what it was they were fighting over. And you know there was a funeral, we were having a funeral and they, the, the deceased had been a part of both choirs that these two presidents led and, and they were fighting over what role the choir was going to wear to sing over the person who had died. When I found out what the fight was about, I said, well, I tell you what, everybody, take off your robes. 
They were, sent, they were incensed. They couldn't understand it. I said, because the dearly departed is dead. She ain't in neither choir no more. Change is difficult because it moves us off of the sure things that we've built our lives around. Oh, we can take some action, but a lot of times the action we take is superficial action. It's, it's chewing the scenery like we used to learn in Grand Opera. It's, it's, it's chewing the scenery. It's looking like you're doing something sometimes and you really ain't doing nothing. Shakespeare called it sound and fury signifying nothing. But people hate preaching because preaching challenges us to actually show enough change. So it is that... The Lord says, verse, 30, verse 31b, he says, loving words are on their lips, but they continue their greedy ways. The Lord says they hear and don't do. And now he says the people do, but don't change. The, the Lord acknowledges that the folk have the appearance of doing what's right and good, loving words, but the things they do don't support what they say. He tells Reverend Ezekiel that lip service is not good enough to satisfy a God who requires transformation. Somebody missed a shout cue. That's the final reason that folk hate preaching because it challenges us to change. Now, I've been around just long enough to know that God's folk will accept just about anything but change. Not true change. God's objection here is not that the folk have not changed. His objection, uh, that not that they haven't taken action. His objection is that they haven't changed but the surface of things. The, the right words are on their lips, but they don't show up in their actions. Now, this is the great miracle of preaching. We have the audacity to believe that anybody can change. I really want to quit preaching right there, Pastor, if I can. I just want to quit preaching right there. And I just want to celebrate and, and I want to testify that that's why I preach. That's why I preach. Because for the first 20 years of preaching, I could not have been preaching for the money. For the first 20 years, I was preaching for a turkey and preaching for... Y'all city folk don't know nothing about pounding a preacher, do you? Yeah, I was preaching for a ham. I was preaching for some grits. And guess what? I was glad to get them. But it sure didn't put no Benjamins in my pocket. I couldn't have been preaching for the money. The reason I started preaching was because it thrilled me. It kept me up at night. It woke me up early in the morning. It drove me to the pulpit exhausted every Sunday because I had been given the privilege of seeing lives change. I'd seen people come in down and depressed. I'd watched them go out lifted up because God had given them hope. That's why we preach. Folk hate that very thing about preaching, that it challenges us to change. But how many know that God can change us? God can change us even when you don't want to change. And he can make something out of nothing. Oh God, that's where I want to leave, right there. He can make something out of nothing. God can change us. This is the God we serve. He's a paradoxical God. He operates in the paradox. He, he does what you don't expect him to do. When you deserve the worst, he gives you the best. When you deserve nothing and you deserve him to give you what you have earned, instead he gives you what you have not earned, what you could not buy. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found blind but now I see that's why I preach I preach because preaching can change folk preaching the preaching of the gospel can turn a, a wayward soul into somebody whose eye is on the prize preaching can transform somebody from the guttermost to the uttermost uh, preaching can transform somebody from having no hope to having their hope built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness as for me y'all I dare not trust the sweetest frame but a holy lean on Jesus
Jesus' name. That's why I preach. I, I preach because it makes a difference. Ezekiel stood as the progenitor, as the headwaters of a mighty preaching prophetic tradition. He stood there declaring, crying loud and sparing not and telling folk about what God wanted from them. And, and the result was everybody didn't go along. Everybody didn't say amen. Everybody had some folk in my life pick up the newspaper and read the paper while I was preaching. But I kept on preaching. I had some folk hate on me when I preached the gospel but I kept on preaching. I had some folk leave me and walk away because I was preaching but I kept on preaching. I'm so glad that when you preach and when you preach right when you preach kerygma, when you connect with gossamer thread, the life, death, and resurrection of him who declared, I am, I am the door of the sheep. He who comes in by another is a thief and a robber. When you preach, the one who said, I am the good shepherd, I laid down my life for my sheep. When you preach that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. When you preach that you will have weeping for a night, but joy comes in the morning. When you preach, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. When you preach, if suffering endures for a season, don't think it's strange when those temptations come on you. But you just be faithful. You just hold on for a little while longer, and God will exalt you in due season when you preach that this old world is not our home we gotta move out to a better home when you preach that there is somebody called the word and the word was with God and the word was God the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him and without him was nothing made that was made and the word became flesh and dwelt among us when you preach and then call the ancestors to say he walks with me he talks with me and tells me I am his own when you preach and call Roberta Martin I know the Lord will make a way yeah yeah yes he will yeah 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 so preach till heaven and hell come back together preach till sinners come saying what must I do to be saved preach till joy runs over the church preach till hope stands sentinel over darkness preach until light shines in the midst of despair preach until the song rings out I know whom I have believed Preach! Hallelujah. Hallelujah! 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 What a word! What a word! What a word! Come on, everyone standing in here. Come on, what a word, what a word we have heard in this house tonight. Thank you, Dr. Wary, thank you so much for the word. Thank you. As the deacons and the ministers come, after such a word, after such a word, 
You've got to make a decision. Amen? Have you been blessed tonight? Did the word help anybody? Did it make, make it clear to you? Thank you, Jesus. This thing is not about our personality. It's all about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Does anybody realize that? This is the time in our worship where you make a decision. You've heard the word. He really preached that word, didn't he? He made it plain. He made it plain. And one of the things that he said that made sense to me, that spoke to me, is the, one of the reasons why the preacher preaches. It is so that we can change. Amen. Amen. Thank God for the word. Thank God for the word that helps us to change. Hallelujah. When I consider where I am today, I ought to be a whole lot different than I was 10, 15 years ago. Anybody thankful for a change? Aren't you thankful for a change? Well, I'm going to offer Christ to somebody tonight. You heard the word. You heard the word. And by hearing the word, did the word speak to you? Did it cause you to look at yourself? Not at anybody else. You had to begin to think about yourself and where you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have not decided, if you have not decided to make Jesus your choice, not just to talk about him, but to have a relationship with him, then I offer Christ to you tonight. I offer Christ to you tonight. You know, if you've been doing the same thing over and over and over again, Expecting a different result. That is insanity. I suggest you make a change tonight. You do something different. Step out of your old, ugly ways. Hey, come on. I don't think that there's a perfect person in the building. All of us have had to make a decision. So I'm going to pray now. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to consider your own ways. Consider where you are with Jesus Christ. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. Father, it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we come. And Father, we come, first of all, because we love you. And God, because of this word, because of this preached word, God, we know that the preached word causes us to look at ourselves. And so, God, tonight, there are people in this room. They came. They came here tonight because they wanted to hear a word. They wanted to celebrate a great preacher. But, God, because of the preached word, cause us to do some inventory. Cause us to look at ourselves and not look outward at other people. God, help us to consider where we are with you. God, we want to be right. We want to do right. And so, God, in the name of Jesus, as you begin to cleanse us, as you begin to take out of us things that we don't need, things that we shouldn't say and places we ought not go, God, as you draw us closer to you, help us to consider a relationship with you. God, some of us have just been coming to church because they think it's a great thing to do. But God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you help somebody realize that coming to church and having a relationship with you are two different things. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that somebody looks inward. They see themselves and they say, I want a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to let go of my old ways. I want to let go of the baggage. I want to let go of the things I used to do. And I want to pick up some new ways. God, we love you. God, move up and down every hour right now in the name of Jesus. God, help us to be the men and the women of God that you've called us to be. 
God, touch somebody right now. Ask them, oh God, to consider their ways and come into relationship with you. God, we love you right now. We thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're here tonight and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I offer Christ to you tonight. The doors of the church are open to you. I also offer a church to you tonight. If you came here tonight, there are two churches that are in this building, Mayfield and St. Paul. If you don't have a church home, we can offer you a church home. So if you're here and you don't have a relationship and you want a relationship tonight, we invite you to come, man, woman, boy, or girl. If you would like a church home, a place to call home, we offer that to you tonight. Amen. Amen. If you're satisfied, come on, put your hands together here. Come on, put your hands together. Come on, you may have your seats. Let us thank God for the preacher, and let us thank God one more time for the preached word. St. Paul Mayfield Memorial, if you would do me the favor in welcoming our pastor to the pulpit. He has not been up here in a couple weeks, so don't get happy with your remarks. Come on, if you would, put your hands together for our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Robert Charles Scott. Good evening. Um, first, I thank God for allowing for us to be here. And for those who have pressed your way, thank you all so very much. I know that, of course, um, uh, this being on a Thursday night, a lot of things that are going on. But I'm appreciative for those of you who have pressed your way. I, I want to um, just do a couple of things, and I'll be more engaging on, on Sunday morning. Um, I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank God for laying on the hearts of the people here at the St. Paul Church. The wonderful opportunity for me to partner with you in doing life with you as your fellow disciple and as your pastor. And I am so appreciative of Pierre and of Cheris um, and how they have been rolling with me uh, during this particular time and St. Paul for your gracious, gracious kindness and openness you have given to Peer and Cheris. For me, that has just made a wonderful, wonderful impression, but even more importantly than that, an awesome way of, for us to transition and to have been here for three years without complaint. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the staff of this church. Uh, let's give God praise for them. The wonderful people I have to work with day in and day out, uh, as well as the board of directors uh, who continue to give me insight and, of course, serve so wonderfully and faithfully. And then the ministers of the gospel that are here who help with various assignments, as well as our diaconate, the other leaders of this wonderful church, and to all the disciples that are here. Thank you all so very, very much for the kindness and the graciousness you all have shown toward me as well as my family over these three years. I also want to thank one of the most gifted preachers in this country for taking time out, Dr. Peter Weary. Thank you, my leader. Amen. Go ahead, give God praise. What a word. What a word. What a word. Thank you to our sister church, Mayfield Memorial for coming and for sharing with us uh, as far as this evening is concerned. And I want to thank all of those that put together a wonderful dinner celebration this evening. My heart is just overwhelmed. I almost fell to the floor like I did when Pierre threw me my 45th surprise birthday party um, and I didn't know it was happening. And when I walked in, I literally ran out the building to the parking lot and they had to come get me. Uh, but I was so blown away uh, by your kindness and by the largesse that has been, been shared. So um, it is uh, 8.39. We're getting out in great time. Uh, Dr. Peter Weary, I can't thank you enough. 
and to those who have been in charge of the pulpit, Dr. Redman, and soon to be Dr. McNeil in about, oh, we say probably about another, what, six, seven months? About another six months. Amen, 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 amen. Amen, amen. So I'm going to turn it back into the hands of, uh, who do I give this mic to? All right. To the person that served as the moderator of the association when I came here, but also served as the moderator to help me get here. Dr. Peter Weary, can you come? And again, thank you so much for this powerful and timely word. Love you, love you. I have a... Um financial gift for the pastor of my own but I want to leave this with you now it's been a long week and so I don't know how much voice I got left for Eric you know what can y'all help me say congratulations our uh, phenomenal organist brother Eric Lord got married last week amen <laughs> And I'm certain there was wailing in Rama behind the wedding. <laughs> but your, your congratulations, brother. We have, uh, we have loved you, so we still do. Uh, I, I, want to, I want to try this, and I don't know, uh, I always say the key of Q, so you may not be able to catch me, but I'm going to start it. And this is for you, my beloved brother. Beautiful are the feet of those who carry the gospel. They go where they are sent without a compliment, but they still give. They inspire others to live beautiful, so beautiful, beautiful, they have beautiful feet. Beautiful are the feet of those who carry this gospel. Oh, if you only knew the things that they go through, yet they still smile. Sometimes crying inside beautiful so beautiful beautiful they have beautiful feet so the refrain says so don't give up on this gospel. Don't let life destroy your faith. Don't give up on this man. Beautiful, so beautiful, beautiful, you have beautiful feet. Hear that refrain again. It says, So don't give up on this gospel don't let life destroy your faith oh, don't give up on this 
look to the Lord to be dismissed. Would you stand? Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen.